In order to wrap up this chapter, let's go ahead and see how jobs in the United States have changed over a long period of time, say since in the 1950s. So how is the labor market and how have jobs changed in the present versus the past? So here we have jobs of the present, jobs of the past versus the present. So go back and think to the 1950s. What type of jobs do you think were very prevalent during this time period? And the thing that probably pops into your mind first is going to be the manufacturing field. So we did have a lot of manufacturing in the United States in the 1950s, 1960s, but that really isn't going to be the case nowadays. So we see a huge shift of jobs in the manufacturing fields to what industries? We see a lot in healthcare technological sort of industries. We see a lot of services as well. So in this amount of time, we do see quite a big shift in where the jobs are going to be in the United States. We, shift, we shifted from manufacturing, manufacturing to things like technology. So technology, there is a very big one, Silicon Valley, with uh, all the tech industries that we have there. We see we are very big service-based industry nowadays, services. So a very big shift from manufacturing to technology and services, and also the healthcare, as we've said before. So with all of this, we do notice that the United States, the jobs of the past, say, in the 1950s, are vastly different to the jobs that we have right now. We're very reliant on humans. So we're very reliant on the technology that we want to invent, and we're also very reliant on things that we have to deal with with our hands in terms of services. We also see that there's a very huge increase in the amount of reliance on inter on an international basis so there's international trade and investment so international trade and investment and that's meant so in the 1950s it would be very foreign to think about foreign countries investing in the United States' businesses or opening up our borders to these type of things. But nowadays, it's very common for us to open up our borders and do a lot of outsourcing as well. So a lot of countries, especially in the United States, we do outsource a lot of our work. So outsourcing of jobs. So what exactly is outsourcing? It's just outsourcing saying that here in the United States, our workers have a very high labor cost. We need to pay them quite a high wage. But over abroad, we can pay workers to do the same exact job in international countries on a much lower cost basis. So what type of jobs do we tend to outsource here in the United States? We tend to outsource jobs in industries that require a lot of labor. So outsourcing of jobs in industries that require a lot of labor. That require a lot of labor, a lot of labor. So things like uh, services, once again, so tech services, when we go ahead and call a help center in order to help us with a particular problem that we may have, we typically know that we're not talking to someone within the United States. A lot of our manufacturing has gone abroad as well. So anything that requires a lot of labor that is very costly for us to have maintained in such a large labor force are things that we have tended to outsource over the years. And finally here, technology once again has changed how we have how the jobs have sort of moved in the United States over the past, and that's with the internet. So the internet has made our needs a lot more flexible on a labor basis. So before, we probably needed a person to be on site every single day to manage, to do things. But nowadays, we have the technology to say that, hey, we only need one person to oversee maybe hundreds or even thousands of employees, and they can do so at the convenience of their own home using computers and the internet. A lot to say in terms of education as well. We really don't need a physical presence in order to give education to students. We can go ahead and use the internet to help us do this sort of feat. So as we see right here, the jobs of the past versus the present, the labor market within the United States has changed quite a lot. And we can go ahead and do a little bit more of a general sort of case as well. So we notice that there's a lot more women in the in the labor force nowadays, where as before, very few women were in the labor force. They were seen as the homemakers as and basically had to take care of the house hold sort of chores, but nowadays we do see a lot more women in all different fields within the labor force. We see them as truck drivers, we see them as doctors, we see them in all fields, and that's just a really good thing for any country to have, to have that type of diversity and to open up all the industries and jobs to both genders. We also see, notice that in terms of the makeup of who does the jobs, we notice that in terms of families, they are more 
two earner households rather than one earner households that we had previously in the past. So before we typically relied on just one person, typically the man, the head of household to bring income for the entire family. But we do notice that with more people in the labor force looking for jobs, we now see that households typically have two head of households, both of them having a job and earning some type of income in order to supplement their family. So a lot of things have changed in terms of the United States in terms of the labor force, and these are just a few of the things that we have noted. So we do focus more on services, healthcare, transportation, and information technology, and this increased technology and the growth of high school jobs has laid a greater importance on education, which is why so many people nowadays are pursuing an education investment, hoping to reap the benefits of that. And we'll take a closer look at the human capital markets to see what the optimal amount of education investment you guys should be undertaking in the next chapter. So this entire chapter was devoted towards the labor markets and we did quite a bit of work taking a look at the supply of labor, the demand for labor, and seeing exactly how many workers is going to be optimal for any firm to hire. Then we got a little bit more into the idea of economic discrimination, taking a look at the two differing theories of economic discrimination and seeing why some individuals may be earning more or less than other people, even though they may complete the same exact task or job. Then we sort of close by taking a look at the different types of unions and why unions are so important within our economic workforce. With all of this in mind, Always a great job. I'll see you guys in the next chapter where we go ahead and take a look at the factors of production or other factors of production and resources and the type of supply and demand sort of analyses and markets that develop under them.